One of the early issues in, in regard to the Quality Education Act uh, was that instead of waiting for the Abbott v. Burke decision to come down, the Florio team, in anticipation of it coming down, came out with the Quality Education Act. Um, would there have been, again, this, uh, uh, this is all 2020 hindsight, um, one of Tom Kane's great successes was getting taxes increased by being dragged kicking and screaming to sign the legislation to increase the taxes rather than being out in front proposing them. Might Jim Florio have done better to have waited for the court to make its pronouncement on Abbott versus Burke and then over a period of time gotten the legislature to push him to do the things that ended up being done? <laughs> Every time I hear a complaint about an activist court, and you hear that a lot from a certain political quadrant, I am reminded of the summer of 1976 when the New Jersey Supreme Court closed the schools and forced the legislature to act. And the New Jersey Supreme Court did so because for the previous three years, the New Jersey legislature had not acted in response to a prior order. And I remember thinking at the time and saying at the time, for those, to those who criticized the New Jersey Supreme Court for being activist, all they did was to step into a vacuum that the legislature had created. That the public interest required action, the legislature had not acted, so the court did. Now, in answer to your question, Jim Florio, we didn't, by the way, anticipate by a lot. We knew the decision was coming. Everybody did. We didn't know the exact parameters and the exact requirements. We had to wait for those. But the main thrust of what the court was going to do was common knowledge on the street as well as in policy halls. So we started with that to exercise the leadership that we believed the people of New Jersey had asked Jim Florio to exercise. Would the whole political by dynamic have been different if he had sat back and been passive and let the legislature work uh, the process? Perhaps, but perhaps not. The experience that we had all seen in the 1970s was that the political process might not have allowed the legislature to actively engage and address and resolve the issues. Somebody has to lead. In New Jersey, our philosophy was, and mine still is, that's the governor. If the governor doesn't lead, nobody will. And I respectfully disagree with your description about Tom Kane, whom I thought was a very good governor. Uh, and he and I have had this conversation on a number of occasions. If you want to make a lot of money, if you want to make a lot of money, engage anybody you know in a wager to identify which governor of New Jersey is the only governor of New Jersey to have signed increases in the income tax, the sales tax, and the corporate business tax. And you will win that bet every time because they will give you Byrne, they will give you Florio, they will give you Corzine, they will give you any Democrat, but they will not give you the truth, which is Tom Kane. And when I mentioned that to Tom the last time I saw him, he said, yeah, and he says, if you'd have sent me the gasoline tax, I'd have signed that too. <laughs> the fact is, he wasn't dragged kicking and screaming. All of these things were done in the first four months of his administration. I was the majority leader at the time. And I'll, on another occasion, if you want, I'll tell you how that happened. But what he did masterfully, much, much better than Florio ever did, was to create exactly the mantra that you have just described. Now, he had a benefit that Florio did not. As it happened, Florio was not at fault. Cain is not to be credited. It is what it is. In 1982, after Kane asked the legislature for and got all of those tax increases, the next four or five years in the early and mid-80s were a time of economic upswing and expansion. So he never at any time for the rest of his eight years in, in office had to come back to the legislature for anything else.